um, on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. Well, hello there. It's six o'clock. I'm Michelle Jubri, and this is Jubes and Co. The show where we'll get into the things that have got you talking today. Now, after two years in the making, the Labour Party have unveiled their blueprint for constitutional reform, prepared, by the way, by none other than former Prime Minister Gordon Brown. It's packed full of stuff. I think it's about 40 points, uh, full of things like abolishing the House of Lords and more devolution. It's all open to consultation. So you know what we do on this show, don't you? We get into it, so let's consult. I want your thoughts on it all. Do you think uh, this is the future of the country? Do you like what you've seen? Are you filled with optimism, ambition? And are you nice and positive today? I want your thoughts and flexible working. Get this very soon. It'll be our right to request it from day one of the job. Brilliant. I hear you shout if you are in ind indeed an employee that could do such a thing. But how flexible do you reckon employers should be? I've said this for a while. I personally worry that some of these jobs, before you know it, they will be going off. Sure, they were going overseas. Do you think I'm just being a dinosaur? Or do you agree with me? Or do you think the world of work basically just needs to evolve? And prisoners, many of them now being locked up for 23 hours a day, prison bosses warning that this means that people will be likely to re-offend. So I'm asking you tonight, how should prisoners be treated? I'll have all of that to come, but first let's bring ourselves up to speed with tonight's latest headlines. Michelle, thank you. I'm Tatiana Sanchez in the GB Newsroom. A 12-year-old child is the first secondary school student to have died after contracting Strep A during the current outbreak. The UK Health Security Agency confirmed a single case of the invasive infection was identified at Colf School in South London. Downing Street is urging parents to be on the lookout for symptoms and say there are no shortages of antibiotics. More than 850 cases were reported in the week starting the 14th of November, compared to over 180 for the same period last year. Dr Chris Smith says Strep A can easily be treated if the symptoms are caught early. If you've got a, a bright red uh, flushed appearance on your cheeks, that could be that you've got scarlet fever. This is one sign that the infection is becoming more significant and it could then become an invasive infection. If a person doesn't get better with the normal trajectory of a cold, they've got those, those rash signs. They're also showing other signs of, of deterioration. Then you should definitely seek a second opinion from your GP. And the good news is that if caught early, these strep infections respond reliably and reassuringly to cheap and cheerful, very safe antibiotics like amoxicillin. 
The RMT is being urged to think again about staging rail strikes which threaten to bring travel chaos over Christmas. Number 10 says the current offer of an 8% pay rise over two years as well as a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies before April 2024 is fair. It was rejected by the union which says the deal won't protect its members and will lead to unsafe practices. Labour says it will look at abolishing the House of Lords if it wins the next general election. Sir Keir Starmer set out his blueprint for a new Britain during a speech in Leeds promising the biggest ever transfer of power from Westminster to nations and regions if his party comes into power. Launching a report which was led by former Prime Minister Gordon Brown, he vowed to overhaul the way the country is governed. This broken model has held back our politics and held back our economy. And I'm determined we unbind ourselves and free our potential. Britain is one of the most centralised systems in Europe and the centre has not delivered. Now, I don't want it to fall apart. I want us to build something new. Downing Street says it's confident the UK has sufficient energy supplies ahead of temperatures severely set to drop this week. A cold weather alert has been issued for England, with severe conditions forecast from 6pm Wednesday to next Monday. A yellow warning for snow has also been issued for northern Scotland, with temperatures expected to fall to as low as minus 10 overnight. Healthcare services are urging people to protect vulnerable and high-risk groups. Police say watches and jewellery were stolen during a burglary at Raheem Sterling's home. The England Forwards family came home to find a number of items were missing, but Surrey police say it's not clear when they were taken. Manager Gareth Southgate hasn't been able to confirm whether the footballer will return to Qatar to play in the World Cup quarter-final this weekend. Meanwhile, England is now preparing to take on reigning champions France on Saturday. Bukayo Saka scored against Senegal last night in the 3-0 victory. He says England have nothing to fear in their upcoming clash. There's no doubt, you know, the, the quality we have in our team. You know, we're blessed with an amazing front line with so much quality um, attacking players. And, yeah, when you get selected in that, in that line-up, it... It shows how much confidence and trust the coach puts in you, so it gives you that extra confidence to go out there and shine. And last night you were able to do that. Prince Harry has spoken about the pain and suffering of women marrying into the royal family, calling it an institution. The latest allegation was made in a Netflix docuseries that airs this week. There's a hierarchy of the family. You know, there's leaking, but there's also planting of stories. There was a war against Meghan to suit other people's agendas. It's about hatred. It's about race. It's a dirty game. The pain and suffering of women marrying into this institution, this feeding frenzy. I realized they're never going to protect you. I was terrified. I didn't want history to repeat itself. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now it's back to Dubes & Co. Thanks for that, Tatiana. Well, um, I'm with you right through till 7 o'clock tonight. Keeping me company alongside me, I've got the editor of the Labour of Labour and Cut, Atul Hatwell. Good evening. And alongside him, the entrepreneur, David Tabazol. Good evening to you too. And you know the drill, don't you, on Jubes & Co? It's not just about us three. It's about you at home as well. What's on your mind tonight? Uh, the story is I'll be getting into Labour's plan. I want prisons as well to be on my agenda for tonight. If you lock people up for 23 hours a day, you're just asking for trouble. Are they basically going to go straight back out and recommit the crime? Tim, he's been in touch. He says he's been in prison a few times. He says you are your own rehabilitation. It's in the head, says Tim. Uh, yeah, but Tim, does it matter what you do with all your time? Can you? What about your head? Can you control your head if you're just locked in a box for 23 hours a day? Day. I'm fascinated by your thoughts on that. The whole regional um, disparity, we go around these circles, don't we? Is Labour uh, the ones with the answers today? What do you reckon to that? And flexible working, apparently, you can demand it now, or you can request it, should I say, from day one in your new job. Is this just a recipe uh, for basically finding yourself out of a job 
Uh, how how uh, flexible do you reckon employers have to be? You know, you can request all you want. They don't have to give you it, though. Are you just one? Are you just kind of sitting there thinking, if I push a little bit too much, am I going to lose my job? Or are you shouting at your screen, pack it in, Michelle, be more modern? It's all about flexible working these days. GB Views at gbnews.uk is my email. You can tweet me at gbnews. Uh, but first, the big news in town today is this announcement from the Labour Party. Uh, it contains a lot of stuff. It's about 40 points, 150-odd pages. Uh, if you think to yourself, how am I going to get to sleep tonight? You can get it. You can read that. Uh, you'll probably be asleep by half of it. I don't know. You tell me how many pages you get through anyway. Uh, they're promising this whole kind of bunch of stuff, or they're evaluating it anyway. One of them is things like abolishing the House of Lords as quickly as possible, poss possibly within the first term if they get elected. Uh, lots of regional stuff as well, lots more devolution. Let's just have a listen, though, shall we, to what the Labour leader said this morning. Labour will rebuild trust by reforming the centre of government cleaning up sleaze, nourishing the relationship between central government and the devolved authorities, and replacing the unelected House of Lords with a new, smaller, democratically elected second chamber. Not only less expensive, but also representing the regions and nations of the United Kingdom. Oh, yes, love a bit of nourishment, don't you? Uh, do you believe that, though? When you listen to that, do you think, yes, that is the answer to me? Um, Atul, I want to start with you, first and foremost. Gordon Brown uh, is the man that was commissioned to do this report. Mm. It's taken about two years. First question from me is, do you think he was the man for the job? I think Gordon Brown has tremendous experience. He's been Chancellor, he's been Prime Minister. And during the Scottish referendum in 2014, he made an absolutely pivotal uh, intervention. So this is a man who's deeply invested in the constitutional settlement of the United Kingdom and keeping the United Kingdom together. So I think there's very few people who would be better placed than him to advise. But the key point is, he's an advisor. Keir Starmer is the decider. Well, it's all open for consultation as well. So what you've seen today, if you've seen this report, it's not a done deal. It's to debate, discuss and see what comes out the other end. Gordon Brown, uh, do you think he was the man for the job to lead this kind of report review? I think Gordon Brown, I've got a lot of respect for him. I'm glad he's no longer part of active government. I think his time is gone. I think his views as a, as a traditional socialist, are, are, we certainly don't want that now. But let's talk about the actual uh, proposal. Talk about the House of Lords, for example. Um, currently, we are the only industrialised country to have a larger second chamber than the primary elected chamber. That's wrong. Um, in the 21st century, do we really need um, our, <laughs> our second chamber... Um, to include uh, 92 or 91 hereditary peers, 25 bishops. Um, well, we might as well have some druids sitting there. I have to say, my experience with the House of Lords, and I've been there many times, has been that these are harder-working people than MPs. Um, I think that a lot of them have got there by virtue of uh, donations. I'm not happy about that. But primarily, my experience of the individual peers are that they have been the most uh, conscientious uh, experts I've ever come across in any political chamber. So I'd be very careful about just abolishing it for the sake of it. So you would keep it, but perhaps tweak it? What we've been through, it's really nice to have real politics with real change going on post-Brexit, no more migration conversations, nice to talk about real pre-election stuff, real strategy. What I would be doing is saying, right, MPs particularly, as we've seen recently, need to be held to account. They really do. We need, we need experts to look at them. I would gradually change it. I would get rid of the hereditary peers. I would get rid of the, the uh, r religious uh, the, 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 the bishops. And I would start to elect gradually, um, probably every six months to a year, both regional and strategic and, and, and industry-based executives. That's what I would do and have that as a smaller second chamber. Uh, six months to a year. I mean, goodness me, God knows how many decades it would take. There's about 800 people at the moment in uh, the House of Lords as it stands at the moment. Where do you stand on this whole uh, so-called uh, abolishment of the Lords? Agree? Disagree? Agree. Abolish the Lords. I think I'd move quicker than David. I think our, my, the destination, the end point, would be very similar to David's. There is a requirement for expertise, but it doesn't have to be in a chamber which, in terms of size, only China's National People's Congress. Mm is bigger than our House of Lords. That is not fit for purpose, and the environment isn't particularly fit for purpose. I would say smaller chamber, expertise, regional representation, and I'd also chuck in, let's move it out of London. And you do it all at once? Um, I think one can... As long as one knows the destination, one can chart a path to, to landing. It doesn't have to be done overnight. 
but maybe a year, two years. And I think it's part of a package of reform. When, the, when a Labour government comes, part of the renewal of this country, as symbols of renewal, will be things like that. Because I, was a, I worked for the Labour Party in the 90s, and when we came in 97, the, const, the, re, the revising of the constitutional settlement was part of the broader renewal, and I think those symbols are important. Where would you put it? You said move out of London. Uh, I think that is open to question. Um, it could be in the northwest, northeast, southwest, wh wherever. And there's different processes to be able to identify where to put it. And but... how big? You said you want it a lot smaller. How big? Um, well, right now, it's, as you said, several hundred. I think it's actually over a thousand people can, can tip up to the House of Lords if they want to at any one, uh, any one time. I'd probably keep it down into uh, 100, 200. I think n the, the function needs to drive the form. So experts, but how many experts? What fields? So there's business, there's specialisms, um, and also representation for our regional, uh, regional uh, tier of governance. So whatever that is, it doesn't have to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. It doesn't have to be in London. And it can be in a new, in a new environment, in a new building, somewhere outside of London. I think the, ex the experience in this country of moving things out of London has actually been very productive. I think when you know, the Treasury campus being mo moved to, to Darlington is actually a very productive thing. See, I, I do fully agree, actually, in terms of relocating away from London. Why should London be the centre of the power? Get it up north. Do you agree with that? Disagree? No, I don't. And also, I still, I, first of all, I you think... You don't we, agree we, with me? Well, no, I don't agree at all. I think, I think we, you know... Um, centres of excellence are geographical and ideological. Centres of excellence, right? You go to Hollywood, that's where the great screenwriters are. You go to Bollywood, that's where the great Indian film industry is. You go to LA, that's where that's where the computer games industry is. You go to Silicon Valley, that's where the... Yeah, you've but got you're to have not people together. To the House of Lords of a centre of excellence, I uh, Yes, I do. I think really? it is. I think people will be shouting at my screen, people like Michelle Mern, stuff like that, centre of excellence. Well, I think it is. I think it's uh, partly, I think it's got uh, probably 50% of its members are doing a very fine job and are, are, are probably better human beings with more integrity than our so-called elected chamber. That's what I think. And I think moving everything about just just for cosmetic purposes, let's all, why, let's all go and sit on the Isle of Wight. It makes but, no difference. And I don't think we're moving everything about. And I think your point is, is right about centres. But, and it works for the film industry. It works in industry. But this is meant to be the seat of governance for the country. Mm. And I think it makes a difference. So just when... The BBC was meant to was uh, moved to Salford. The Treasury campus moved to Darlington. These things make a difference. And at better. minimum, the, the the absolute nightmare of trains in the north. Well, that, something would be but, done but about that. Hang on, has it got better? Has it got better? The BBC hasn't got better. The Treasury, you may think, has got better, but I tell you what, we've got a, we've got a, a, a very inefficient economy. We're, we've we've got economic decline. The BBC is no is, is by no means the, the 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 greatest stuff, the greatest broadcaster in the world anymore. We can't trust the news. And I don't this think is an so. interesting point. So I think what you're getting at here in terms of the Salford thing, the relocation, it's fascinating. I want to get into regions in just a few minutes after the break. But let me ask you one of the problems that I've got with the Lords. Uh, Three hundred and twenty-three pounds a day is your allowance, right? And don't... By the way, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. If you want to get me in the laws, I'll be there tomorrow. I'll take it all day long <laughs> just to get that on the table. But why should they get £323 a day that's not taxed? Infuriates me. Why? What's the justification for that? I think that it's a function of the Lords being betwixt and between. It's a sort of ritual... It has a ritualistic ceremonial position... Uh, where people can do work if they're not and, uh, and don't have Come and some do. Come off But, that is but pay what? a smaller chamber where people get a, people get paid properly and it's not kind of tax-free. And that, that smaller chamber where you have experts, you have business people, you have our regionally elected um, governance uh, represented. I think it, I would have... Le I, similarly, for lots of those folks in the Lords, have a, a, find it really challenging, especially in these current times, that so much money, you know, you kind of punch your card when you go in and you get 300 quid. I mean, it's ridiculous. But I'd have lost less of a problem with it if it was a tighter, more focused, harder-working chamber. And I think there are very hard-working people there, but just not all of them. David, I would go as far as saying you are one of Britain's best businessmen. Tell me, I, am I missing something here? Because I think it's a disgrace, quite frankly, that this allowance is tax-free. I've asked loads about this when they've been on my show. I've asked them, what do you think to this? And they kind of say to me, oh, well, it's just difficult to know how to tax it, really. It's not a salary. It's not, it's not difficult how to tax it. You put it through, you stick a tax code on it, and you pay your tax on it. Well, of course they missing. should be... Well, you're not missing anything, but we need a new constitution. We definitely need reform of the House of Lords. 
uh, I think we, we've got to have an elected chamber uh, with some appointments. Maybe a third of it, the, a third of the members could be appointed. Um, I do believe they have to be right next to the Houses of Parliament, the House of Commons, because otherwise there's no interaction. So I mean, we'll, we'll talk about the regionalisation. We will. But there's no way, no way that people should be paid tax free. That is disgraceful. But then why has no one changed it? Because that's not a new thing, is that's it? That's your job. <laughs> well, there you go, but I'm absolutely astonished. It's amazing, well, isn't it? Well, how has all of this gone for I so long be... that they don't pay a tax on it? It's because it's a small part of a bigger problem. And the House... You know, Labour started on House of Lords reform, ran out of steam, ran out of hope, ran out of... Mm. Uh, ran, yes, just ran out of uh, a puff on it, kind of, sometime in the 2000s. At the point when there's a Labour government and at the point when the House of Lords is abolished, which I think it will be abolished, that will be one of the things that's fixed. And this is the there's point. no way a successor organisation has that. One of my viewers, Ken's written in, saying exactly the point that you're making. Um, when Labour were last in government, there was all these talks about kind of shaking up, abolishing whatever it was, the House of Lords. They didn't do it then. So it's why started. are they suddenly going to do it now then? Um, it's a, it was a started, but not, not finished. I think one of the reasons it'll be done now is that it's just festered for so long and its time has, its time has come. And the big, chunky devolution uh, reforms for Northern Ireland, for Scotland and Wales, they're already through. This is where the unfinished business is. This is next on the list. Yeah, and, you know, I asked you guys about Gordon Brown at the start um, of this programme, about whether or not he's the man for the job. You know, I remember meeting Gordon Brown, actually, um, and a very nice guy, very pleasant guy, whatever. Um, but one of the things that always sticks in my mind was that whole Gillian Duffy... Uh, bigot comment, and I know you can dismiss it and go, oh, it's just one comment, da, da, da. but to me, I remember, oh, I can't remember how many years ago it was, but it was years ago, and it sticks with me. And to me, that was very kind of, and is still, very symbolic of the disconnect between a politician and uh, the considerations, concerns of your average uh, member of public. And to me, that Labour Party is supposed to be the ones that are down with those working class people. And I struggle to get past that, really, when I think of Gordon Brown. Many people will be emailing me in, talking about selling off gold reserves and things like that. So I um, find it interesting that he is the choice of person to lead this plan. Well, no-one's perfect. And I don't think he... I think if he could... If, or in his entire life, if he could take back some comments and rewrite some of it, what's happened in his past. So that, that would be one of those episodes. But the focus of what he's doing here is around constitutional reform. It's something he's passionate about and keeping the United Kingdom together. So, you know, he's, he made lots of errors. And, you know, I come from a wing of the party which was never really terribly keen on Gordon Brown, to be honest. Um, but on this, he's passionate and he's sincere, but he's the advisor. And Keir Starmer is the guy who's going to decide. Mm, well consulted by you, me and members of the public. I've got to say, uh, Theo says, Michelle, what is everyone talking about? Uh, people don't even seem to be able to get Brexit done. They will never be able to get rid of the House of Lords if they do. Uh, Theo says he's going to eat his hat. I hope that's not a big hat, Theo, because I think, you know, you, you never say never. You might see these kind of changes. Chris, you're a bit harsher. Uh, you say, Michelle, we would be better off abolishing the whole government. Goodness gracious. Uh, let me know your thoughts. One of you here, Philip, has said, Michelle, London should no longer be the capital city of this country. You're saying it is not a true representation of Britain. Well, Phil, you lead me nicely, so you do, to my next topic, because I'm going to take a quick break. When I come back, I want to talk to you specifically about this whole regional thing. Uh, it's featured a lot in Labour's plans today. They reckon the answer is more devolution. Uh, we just touched briefly briefly in terms of moving the House of Lords. That got uh, a thumbs up from one of my panel, a thumbs down from the other one. Where do you sit on that? Should London, for example, be the be all and end all? How do you level up these regions? Give me your thoughts and I'll see you in a couple of minutes. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
Monday to Thursday, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. Join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prison? I, I don't believe in prison. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB plus digital radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet or online at GBNews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. for Gloria Meets. In exclusive interviews, I'll be finding out who our politicians really are and what they really think. It's something that you would never want anyone to suffer. I didn't know what channels there were. B, I didn't think I'd be believed. I must have weighed about seven stone and I'm five foot eight. My instincts was to sort of cover this up. I mean, clearly that was a mistake. Join me every Sunday at 6 p.m. on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Hello there, welcome back to Jeeves & Co with me, Michelle Jubery, keeping you company right through till 7 o'clock tonight. And alongside me, the editor of Labour and Cut, Atul Hatwell, and the entrepreneur, David Tabersall. We've just been talking uh, about the whole kind of change, uh, abolishment of the House of Lords, where you sit on that. Uh, Richard, you seem like a sensible chap, um, because we've just been talking about why the allowances, the 323 quid, are completely tax-free. Some people say it's all a bit complicated. Uh, Rick's got the answer. Michelle, if it's all too complicated to pay a tax on the allowance, simple. Just reduce the allowance then. Pay them only £250 per day instead. Uh, you don't mess around. Somebody uh, has picked up on the comment as well. I've just lost your name because it's flown through. Uh, saying about trains, you say one of my panel referenced then the trains being so abysmal uh, up north. And you're absolutely right. My viewer says they are. Uh, but my viewer says that's because... It's all going on uh, when it comes to the spending all around the London projects and not uh, enough focus on the regions. Many of you as well are not too happy about HS2. You want rid of that. Um, but that leads me nicely to the, the, the whole kind of regional inequality thing mentioned at the top of the show that there's this big new report now, uh, Labour's so-called 40-point plan as to what they're going to do to fix Britain. One of the areas that gets a lot of attention is this whole kind of regional inequality. There's lots of reports out, one of them out today as well, in terms of uh, the disparity between health, north versus south, and all the rest of it. We know it, we go around it in circles, uh, but how do we fix it then, David? Well, the first thing is there's no such thing as equality, and I don't think a, a, even aiming for it is, is uh, intelligent. And, uh, you're what do you mean? Well, equality of opportunity and equality of access to public services is fine. Equality of outcomes, equality of careers, equality of wealth. But I don't think so. I think that, in, in, like in sport, you have people that work hard ach achieving Olympic gold medals. You have people in... Um, there's a, there's a, uh, the idea of 10,000 hours of practice allows you to be world-class, to, to achieve mastery in something. Right now, if we're, we're, we're really saying differences don't matter. And, and they do. We should embrace difference, difference in outcome. We should be focusing on uh, not where people are in the country, but who they are and what their, what their individual needs in education and healthcare, what, what, you know, what they are. And, and all we're seeing at the moment, I believe, is electioneering. I think this is the Labour Party. I'll tell you what, right, if you live in London, you don't want London to be weaker. And if you live in Edinburgh, you want Edinburgh to be stronger. So all this is is saying, wherever you live, we're going to make you stronger, healthier, richer. We're going to level up. All we are seeing at the moment in this country is levelling down. And I don't want to live in a country where the government, for example, is going around being held on a, on a, on a, on a, you know, on, on a train just so we can give everybody equality of access to that. We need to get real. We need to make the whole country richer. We just sort out the health service, and then then we can talk about equality of opportunity. Sorry about the rant. Is, there, is this just electioneering? Is it just buzzwords? Or is it a true sentiment, a true um, achievable goal, if you like? And what do we even mean, by the way, when we say levelling up? I think there's an evidence base that inequality is rising 
and that the opportunities people have if they're in the North East, if they're in parts of the North West, are, uh, are not just... Keep, they're not keeping pace with those in the South East and they're falling further behind. And underpinning that, I think there's some really startling facts about health and people leaving, um, leaving the labour force in, uh, in parts, in regions of, the, uh, of this country. And I think if you're the government, you can't ignore that. You can't let someone who is born in the North East just have a life where they will have less opportunities, fewer jobs, fewer, uh, less access to training, less access to education. And it's not, a, it's not a kind of party political thing, whether it's Boris Johnson talking about levelling up, which he doesn't deliver, or whether it's Keir Starmer talking about growth and, uh, and tackling... But hang on, because you can't, you can't just dig at Boris Johnson and say he's not delivered it, because the simple fact is nobody's delivered it, of all, of all different colours and stripes, because if someone had delivered it, if a party had delivered it, if a PM had delivered it, I will not be sitting here now in 2022 talking about levelling up, because it would have been achieved. I think you can make a very strong case that 97 to 2010 regional disparities, whilst they still existed, some of those challenges were addressed. Education levels, life expectancy, health, access to health, all of these indicators were headed in the right direction. 12 years of austerity, bad economic choices, bad economic policy, crashing the economy and everyone having to pay extra, extra on their mortgage in the last three months. That is what's pushed, that's what's increased disparity. The objective, I think both parties would share, I don't think there are bad, evil people in the Conservative Party, both parties would share the objective of having greater opportunity in some of those regions where there isn't at the moment. I think the, the, the evidence the last 12 years is this government hasn't delivered. The evidence of 97 to 2010, particularly before to the, the crash, was things were headed in the right direction. There weren't these big waiting lists. You could see a GP. There were enough police. Debt was coming down. Taxes were lower. The building blocks of growth and equality of opportunity were there. That's right. That has to be right. If you have... Um... You cannot merely say we want less, in, less inequality. What you have to do is have a prosperous, well-run nation, uh, an economy that's functioning, and then... And some consensus, by the way, as well. Yeah, but how do you achieve that, then? Well, from how do we achieve it from here, right? Mm -hmm. Because every, every time is different. Right now, we need to start addressing maybe 15 or 16 things, ranging from the, this, this electioneering that's giving people just what they want to hear. We need to start actually addressing the problem. So, number one the health service. Well, we've got a problem because of the mismanagement during COVID. We have 8 million people on a waiting list. It's, it's, it's disgusting. We're going to have to... I, I believe we should be bringing in... We should be creating two or three health services. We can talk about another time. One, one for, one for uh, uh, social care, or one for intensive care. And we need an emergency health service, even if, it, even if we've got to bring in some people on five-year migrant licences, to sort out the operations of the backlog. The second bit... We need to sort out education. Too many people are getting useless and very expensive university degrees. We need to deal with that. We need to start getting national service in, I believe, uh, not military, but a national service which will allow us to pick up the weak, the, uh, the, the, the vulnerable in society as well as create a national consensus and identity. We need to start deciding what on earth this country stands for. If we get richer, then the inequality will still be there, but the bottom, the lower, the the, the 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 people right at the bottom of the of, 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 of you know of the economic food chain, if you like, they'll be all right. Right so, now, we don't have the, we don't have the power. We don't have the money to do it. What do you think this country stands for? David saying that's one of the key things that we need to try and look at. That's one of the key things that this report was trying to look at. What do you think is the answer to that? I think at the at the step one is we've got to get growth. This trust did so much wrong, um, but her focus on growth was actually right. She did it, went about it the wrong way, all the wrong policies, everything in the wrong order. And understanding how we generate growth without increasing taxes, that is actually the key for the next kind of five years. And that's part of and what what's this... So what's your short answer? Um, well, this con re the devolving decision-making for the Labour Party is part of it. Ultimately, you cannot get around that without um, mm. an, some form of improved trading relationship with Europe. We've got to trade more. And actually, you can't get around it, and this is something that actually there's, no, there's not a huge disparity between the two main parties on. Immigration will play a, a key role in it. We just don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough nurses, we don't have enough people to do the jobs in the, in, in the, in the British economy at the moment. Businesses need, have huge labour shortages. We need to plug those gaps. Businesses need to grow. And then we can have a separate discussion about um, distribution, 
generate growth. And then we, there's a separate genuine kind of part, a political discussion about is that tax cuts, is it more investment in public services, but we've got to get growth first. Yeah, see, so where do you stand on all of this? Growth, of course, is the key issue. We had uh, Liz Truss, didn't we? She put that first and foremost. Obviously, we've just been hearing, and many people already know, it didn't go too well, did it? Uh, but what is the answer then? How do you achieve growth? Uh, and also, this whole north-south divide, you know, I don't like how it gets played as a, it's a political football now, isn't it? It's each party, each new prime minister, everyone desperately trying to get a job. Uh, it's saying what they're going to do to help level up the different regions with London and with the South East. But this should have been done a very long time ago. Many people should hold their hands up, actually, and say, when you did stuff like uh, you closed the coal mines, you closed down uh, key industries in a lot of these northern places, you didn't think it through. So there was all well and good closing things, but what was step two? What came after it? Uh, that, for me, is where a lot of the problems lie. And, uh, I mean, we could do a whole topic on this, but I'm going to go to a break in a second and I'll talk about business when I come back. But all about tax, tax incentives. How do you get people like David to set up his business uh, in places like Hull as opposed to in London? Uh, that leads me nicely into my topic after the break because I want to talk to you about the world of work. Uh, from now on, there's new legislation legislation going through that basically would give us all the right to ask for flexible working on day one of our new job. This is a trend, isn't it, at the moment, whether it's four-day weeks, uh, whether it's kind of working from home. There is a shift, isn't there, that the world of work needs to evolve and be more flexible. Is that how we achieve the growth that we've just been discussing? You tell me and I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. We are GB News, the people's channel. Why not take us home with you by visiting the GB News shop at gbnews.store. You'll find all the official merchandise, a really good present actually for yourself, your friends or your family. We ship across the UK mainland at no extra cost. GB News, the people's channel. Here on GB News Live, we'll be keeping you in the picture, finding out what's happening across the country and finding out why it matters to you. We'll have the facts fast with our team of reporters and specialist correspondents. Wherever it's happening, we'll be there from 12 noon on TV, radio and online. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. We're going to be here for you, our GB News family, to keep you up to date, but also make you smile. There's a guy who went from puberty to adultery. <laughs> and I can't wait to bring a few of my own opinions. I have no time for cultural totalitarianism. Yes. We'll engage in passionate, but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubry, right through till 7 o'clock tonight alongside me. I've got the editor of Labour Uncut, Atul Hatwell, and the entrepreneur, David Tabasol. You guys have been getting in touch. Many of you, surprising me, um, you're not in favour of more devolution. Uh, many of you saying so far that the devolution that you have seen has been pretty disastrous. Uh, we've been talking as well about where should the centre of power be? Spencer uh, said, I was asking, do you think we should move the Lords, for example? I don't know, say up north. Spencer says, I'm in York and I don't want any of them up near me. Thank you very much. You can keep them, he says, down in London. Well, there you go. Um, now, are you an employee? Are you an office-based worker? I've got to say, I do think most of these stories kind of fit that, um, that tick that box more, don't they? It's flexible working stuff because good luck being a, 
I don't know, a hairdresser, whatever, uh, sitting there and saying, right, I'm only going to do my work for four days a week or whatever. But uh, the reason I'm talking about this today is that there's going to be new legislation that basically means that staff would be able to request the chance to work from home, do flexi time, etc., on day one uh, of their new employment. What do you make to this at all? I think it's hugely positive. There, there's a limit. Positive for say. who? Uh, positive for employers, and positive for workers, actually positive for the country. And I make two points. First relates to something you said, actually, just before the break, around what happened in the 80s when the mines shut um, and industry closed in the 80s and what happened across the country, because we're seeing something similar. In through the 80s, we had a huge uh, exit of people from the, the labour force into long-term sickness. And we're, fi we're seeing that, again, that's part of that regional inequality we're having, people leaving the labour force into long-term sickness. If you can work more flexibly, then there is a chance to bring these people back if you can be remote. Second thing, where people have caring responsibilities, where people have other things in their life, then they can maybe work two-thirds of the time, half the time. That sort of uh, working arrangement, hugely positive, because it keeps people in touch with the labour market, keeps people paying taxes, earning a wage, putting money back into their local economy. Anything that keeps people working, earning, paying tax has to be a good thing. There's a limit to what, how much you get. You can't be a copper and you can't... Yeah, you can't be a policeman and, uh, and be remote working when you're meant to be on the beat. But wherever possible, anything that increases our participation, the number of people we've got uh, paying into the economy, it's got to be a good thing. Well, there you go. You're an employee, David. Is it positive that people can come to you on day one and say, uh, hey, boss, can I only work four days or can I work, I don't know, Monday, Tuesday from home and Wednesday from there? Is that positive? I think it's absolutely deluded. I think, I think this is an entitled, lazy country... And it's got to get its... It's got to put its sleeves up and get back to work. This is mad. This is... Look at us. We're the only <laughs> um, industrial nation uh, that, is, that is slipping back into the last century. And why is that? We've, we've been taken care of. I, I, I put a lot of this, this mindset down to, to how the government reacted during COVID. Everyone retired early, and, of course, it's really hard. If you marry a rich person, you sit in a castle, of course you like it, right? If you retire early and someone just feeds you food, you know, via, via a, a, a delivery moped, of course you like it. I'll tell you this, right? Recently, I was recruiting somebody, and they didn't admit this, but they, about, about a month or two in, um, they were in South America and having a lovely time, and they weren't on the same time zone. Uh, there's a saying in business, and it's a saying anywhere. If you want something done, ask a busy person. And if you're working three, four days a week here, three, four days a week there, you're not busy. And I tell you, when someone's at home or someone's able to... to the, 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 the lack of... Um, I, I guess the, the, there's something magical that happens when people work together and work hard. And if you're, if you're working not for those two days, not for those three days. It mounts up until you're basically completely useless. It man it, p let's take the World Cup. The reason we have a successful England team at the moment is because they're working full-time. They're dedicated professionals. They're not the fat, smoking, drunken English footballers of 40 years ago. These guys are pros. They're dedicated. Excellence, achievement, growth in a competitive world all comes that's possible. from dedication. All of that's possible with remote... All of that's possible with remote teams. It is not... The, really? The, the, the dire straits we're in economically are not actually, I think, the fault of the British worker. The, Britain has been ill-served by its government over the last... Well, the last... I the, last de, uh, the, last, the last decade. If we can... If, it, if, if, remote, if a level of remote working, a level of flexibility... It doesn't mean everyone's remote all the time. It doesn't mean you can just choose when you dip in or dip out. A level of flexibility means someone who's got a caring responsibility can work. It means uh, someone who's got a uh, child... Uh, ch children's responsibilities can work. It means people who had left the labour market, who were, because they were on the long-term long uh, long sickness, find that they can work three days a week. That's got to be to the benefit. It doesn't mean that we can't have jobs where teams get together. I completely agree, actually. When people get together physically, there's a transformative, imp uh, there's a transformative effect. But that doesn't mean you can't have increased flexibility. It's absolutely key to the, wor to the world of work. Let's, let's, do, let's divide your, your, your comments. Into two. The reason we have a sick nation is because we have 8 million people on the waiting list for the NHS, which is partly down to the fact that government has annihilated our, our, our NHS during COVID, OK? So that's for number one. So we need to solve that problem irrespective of anything with work. 
Now let's talk about flexi working and home working. First of all, my experience of people working at home is that they are 40% as useful as people I can see in front of me. And secondly, if I'm going to recruit someone at home, I would rather be recruiting a Portuguese, Brazilian or an Indian person with a PhD on 20% of the salary of somebody sitting around in, in Finchley um, with, with, with a, uh, pretending to work full time with no qualifications. But I think that the, the, the question there is, how are those people who are remote being managed? Because it's whether you're there, whether you're there on the shop floor or whether you're at home working, coding, doing whatever, it's all about how, the, how these people are being managed. Do they have clear targets? Is the management effective? The, the fact that someone is remote, it does produce, pro, it just generate extra challenges, but it also creates extra opportunities. It creates, it creates extra... What, what, it creates new opportunities because people who couldn't necessarily work. So if you, can have, if you have a business located in London, you can recruit people to be, who are remote, who are living in Newcastle, who are living in Scotland. Oh, we're living in the Philippines. Yes, exactly. Now, that <laughs> response, there, there is, response there, to my point. There, there, there is, there yeah, is this that, is going to lead to most, massive amounts of now, unemployment. And there is, there is an aspect of that where someone is recruiting in the US can recruit someone who's living in Wiltshire. Generally, when, we are, when, we're, when running teams and working in teams, it's better to have people at least where there's a cultural connection and they're in, in the same time. There's no, cultural correct, there's no cultural connection when you're sitting at home with a three-year-old nibbling your socks, right, and, you're, and, and, and the next-door neighbour's lawnmower's going on and, frankly, it takes an hour... You know, a, a, a trip to your kettle takes an hour and a half because somebody rings and there's no-one to stop you. I tell you, it doesn't work and we need to get back to work. Show me one amazing, fast-growing start-up business worth billions where people are working at home. The core I can people. I, I where? Can, I can show you a whole host of them. I can show you Amazon. No, they don't. Google. Yeah, they they didn't start like that. Uh, no, no, they didn't start like that. But Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, of, Amazon tried to implement uh, back to work and found that people were just going to leave. The same happens at Google, the same happens at Microsoft. These are multi-billion pound businesses. And it is that what they're doing is they're not they're responding to the the evolving world the evolving world of work and in the future I mean it's not the world of work I've grown up in but in the future there will be robots replacing these lazy uh, people but there, there'll be a mix where people some people will because of their different caring responsibilities or their different lifestyle choices may choose to work only three days a week that is their choice and it, there will be employers who can fit them in I agree with you you can't run certain types of teams you can't do certain types of tasks you can't run big programs just with everyone remote kind of dipping in and out. But I think the, the point of this is to be able to ask for some flexibility. And flexibility doesn't mean entirely remote. Flexibility could mean uh, on Mondays I'm going to do the school run, I'm in the office full-time all the rest of the week. Flexibility means flexibility. It doesn't mean fully remote for, or fully in can, the office. Can I ask a question? Does this, yes, does, this, does this mean that if you get a job, let's say I recruit a finance director for one of my companies, can they turn around to me and go, you know what, I want flexibility now. Uh, and I'm entitled to it under the law. If I want to sit at home, you know, taking their dog out or something, I don't. I mean, seriously, is this what's going to happen to us in a world of high taxes, high regulations? We don't have the we don't have the uh, uh, bureaucratic reductions we were promised yet uh, under Brexit. All we're getting is more tax and now more rights, more rights, I, I, more I, I rights, more laziness. I, I sympathise with the, the basically. This I sympathise bureaucracy with him quickly tax. though, because I've got to go to a break. Go on. Uh, but. The key is about defining flexibility. To be able to ask for, you know, to be able to go on the school, to do the school run once a week, that doesn't seem to me a terrible idea. It's like Oliver Twist, that's what it is. Kind of, more, please, more, please. <sighs> well, where do you stand? Are you someone uh, who does want more flexibility, who thinks that is the future? You just heard, by the way, I was just talking a moment ago about growth and driving growth. Uh, when, I, when I hear what we need is a more productive economy, we need to grow, we need more businesses, we need more people in work, and then I hear kind of, yeah, and when you're in that work, you can sit at home and you can do this and that. To me, it's almost a contradiction in terms, or am I missing the point? Who do you agree with? Give me your thoughts. GBviews at gbnews.uk is the email, or you can tweet me at gbnews. Going to take a quick break. When I come back, I want to ask you a simple question. How should prisoners be treated? Tell me your thoughts. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs>
Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. We are GB News right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing. You see, amazing. You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Join me, Nana Akue, Saturday and Sunday afternoons on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as me and my panel tackle some of the biggest topics hitting the headlines. It's a place for everyone's opinion. No one gets cancelled, but no one gets an easy ride. <laughs> oh, she's <laughs> on it today! I, 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 I... Be ready for conversations that are fierce, frank and, of course, fun every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 4pm on GB News, the People's Channel. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubey, right through till 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, I've got the editor of Labour and Court, Atul Hatwell, and the entrepreneur, David Tabasol. Good evening. Uh, welcome back to you all. Many of you have given me your thoughts. Uh, during that quick break on that last topic about flexible working, uh, Simon says... Cheeky so-and-so, you don't use that word, but I'll uh, paraphrase because it's tea time. Cheeky so-and-so calling people lazy. He means you, by the way, David. Um, Four-day week would be great and flexible working achieves things. Does that guy want workers like they used to have grafting in the Victorian times? Paul says your entrepreneur is exactly right and it's your other guest that's completely deluded and he's the reason this country is in the mess that it's in. Uh, heaven help us, he says. And Matt says, Michelle, software developers drive industry and they all work from her, many of them, fully remote. Yes, Matt, I appreciate that. My point to you would be, uh, be careful, because if you are a software developer working fully remotely, as Matt says from, I don't know, Hi Wickham, um, it is doable, you know, that actually you can be a software uh, developer working fully remote from, I don't know, the Philippines. If you're fully remote, what does it matter except the cost to your employer? I say, be careful what you wish for. Right, uh, let's talk prisoners, shall we? The man in charge of the country's prisons says that offenders are more likely to re-offend if they've been locked up in their cells for 23 hours a day. Basically, what they're saying is, you know, you need to be rehabilitating people, putting them through classes or whatever to stop them reoffending. Do we? At all? Yes? No? The number one role for prison, in my view, is to keep the population safe. Part of keeping the population safe means that when they get out, they don't reoffend. Everything that can be done to rehabilitate and reduce the risk of reoffending. There's something about punishment. There's something about, um, you know, addressing uh, uh, and redressing the balance, re uh, redress that's there. But f from a societal perspective, locking them up for 23 hours a day they're just going to go, you know, anyone will go stir crazy and it's, you're just going to drive reoffending. And it's just going to cost the, the taxpayer again because they're going to be locked up again. They're going to have to, the police are going to have to arrest them. What it's about just... someone who is never coming out? So if you're on like a fixed life uh, tariff, so you're not coming out anyway, what about them? Well, I mean... Is... Leave them there? It's a, it's a vanishingly small cohort where life means life. Yeah, that kind Shouldn't of... be. Um, but th that's, the, that's the reality. Uh, and again... There is, a, there, there is something around rehabilitation such that if they were... But they're not coming out, these guys, so can I just leave them there for 23 hours? Is that OK? Um, my view would be no. There's a basic set of human rights and that you can't, you can't just treat humans like that. But... Well, don't even get me started on human rights for prisoners because if these people respected human rights in the first place, they wouldn't be doing the crimes that have seen them get whole life tariffs, murdering, raping, all the rest of it. So I always have an issue when people start crying to me about prisoners' human rights, but that's a topic for a different day. Uh, David, where do you stand? I think each, uh, each prisoner 
is different. And the point that the, the, the fact of the matter is we don't uh, we don't address that at the moment. We ha we ha we don't have enough money in in the prison system for uh, prison officers particularly, um, and th that's that's for the sake of society and our safety. That's the first thing I'd change. I'd make I, I, I'd, I'd I'd make it economically viable for people to train in the prison service. Mm. After that, I think you need ten or twenty percent of your of a, of a sentence should be about revenge. Should be about punishment, and after that, um, after they, you know, the prisoners have really understood that they don't want to lose their liberty. There needs to be uh, an assessment of. I mean, we need to be keeping violent prisoners away and locked up, but the bulk of the the rest, we really need to rehabilitate. And and first of all, I'd find a way of making them economically viable, so there is a zero cost to their prison sentence if possible, and I'd start to 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 train them so they come back into the workforce, and also the victims of crime need to be recompensed from that as well. We have student loans being repaid. I think we, 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 we need people who suffer from crimes to be repaid by some form of tax going forward. We need to build a society. Tax from who? So what you're saying, that when these uh, criminals come out of um, prison, they yep. go into the world of work, and I don't know, 10% of their income goes to their victims, something like that? Something like that. And I think that also, um, we, we, just, we just need a, 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 a policy that looks, as, looks at these people as individuals um, and then we're going to have a happier, safer society. Oh, I think you're quite soft, you two. You're quite... I mean, oh, maybe I'm just a bit harsh, maybe I'm just a bit mean, but I just think, do you know what, if you are the kind of squirt that goes around... I'm not talking about someone that's stolen a Mars bar, you know, obviously, some, yeah, let's differentiate a bit. But if you're in prison, there's a reason for that, uh, and you need to learn your lessons and that, for me, is something that needs to be deeply unpleasant when you're in there, so perhaps you think twice about doing it again. Anyway, I've enjoyed the conversation at all, David. Thank you very much for your company, for your thoughts. Thank you to you at home. Up next is Lawrence Fox. Lawrence, good evening. What have you got for us? Good evening, Jubes. And um, I have to say I agree with you on that issue. Anyway, tonight we're talking Twitter files, free speech, football, and the Royal Racist Rumble rambles on. Hello, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Easterly winds have made it feel cold during the last few days, but in the next 24 hours, northerly winds arrive, which will turn things even colder, along with some significant snow.